So what I'm trying to do is sort of teach you some very basics, and for some of you, I'm sure it's a review, but some basics about uh, really the things that we've talked about, what is news and about sto uh, storytelling and things like that. So tonight we're gonna start talking about story structure. And then, and then we're gonna talk about, after this, uh, which, which uh, will be an assignment you'll get, and then we'll actually start to present in class more is, uh, is, is how to pitch a story. Because, they, they, and that's an important part of journalism because you, you will always work with editors. But the whole idea in journalism is that we pitch stories. We talk to other people about our stories. So most likely, if you were going to, if you're going to write a story for a newspaper, or a magazine, or a website, or if you are writing a script for a documentary, then what you will do is you will work with someone else, an editor or a funder or someone like that, and you have to, basically you have to tell them what your story is about, and you have to tell them why it's an important story and the impact of the story. So we started started making the first stride toward doing that last last night when we had the, the three people present, which was very good. I was I was very happy with the way that turned out. So it really is about getting getting you to think about the elements of your story, and and not simply. Uh, and getting it into your head so that much of, much of what happens in writing a news story happens before you ever leave your office going out to, to, to do that, to write. Uh, we do lot, and, and this is particularly true in documentary filmmaking, because you never want to go out to cover a story without being prepared. You want to know what you're getting yourself into. So as much background, and we've talked about background, as much background on your story as you can possibly do, you want to do before you ever go out and start asking people questions or doing anything like that. If you're going to cover a news conference, if it's, if it's a government agency or a private agency or an NGO or a foundation and they're having a news conference, you want to find out as much about that organization and about the work that they do before you go out. Well, the same is true about writing a news story and about writing a script for a documentary film. Before you begin writing, before you begin working on your story or your script, you want to know as much about the topic, about the people, about the communities as you possibly can. Okay, so, so, that, so, so that when you begin to meet with your editors or your funders or your backers, whoever it happens to be, then you make your pitch. Basically, you tell them what the story is about. So we're gonna, so we're gonna progress into that. But tonight, we're gonna start talking about story structure. The whole inverted pyramid. We talked about the inverted pyramid with the idea of it being to get the most important facts first, okay? So, so as I said, we tell stories most of the time in logical order, okay? We tell them in logical order. When we get to, um, to feature writing, which documentary filmmaking uh, is built on, then we start to tell stories more in logical order. And so remember I drew that cocktail glass? So we do that inverted pyramid where we give people a series of facts, starting with the most important things, and then we start to lay the story out in logical order. And then we give them a conclusion to, this, to that story. So that's the first thing we talked about, is, is that, that, that structure of the story. Then we talked about the, the elements of the story, of, of storytelling, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So the reason what we did the, the, the last night is important is because, so when you come back from reporting a story, when you have been out on, in the streets or at a meeting or interviewing people or, or in the countryside or doing whatever you're doing, when you come back and you start to write your story, Okay, then you will be concerned about the who, what, when, where, why, and how. But before you ever go out the door to start writing a story, you must be concerned about those things also. And you must know to the extent that you can the, the, uh, the answers to those questions. And so, so that when you actually go out and start reporting your story, that what you are doing is building on the knowledge that you already have. Does that make sense? So you want, you want to start with some basic knowledge of the story. And then when you get out, you want to do what we talked about. Remember I talked about following the reporting? Which means when you start to find out facts. So you will, you will, you will, background, you will start to background your story before you ever go out and start 
start asking questions before doing interviews or doing other things. And then when you get out there, you will start to find that some of the things that you, that you believed to be true are exactly as you thought they were. You will find that there are some things that you believe to be true that are, are more impactful in whatever way, positively or negatively, than you thought they were. And you will find that some things that you thought were true are completely not true. And, and you must go out into the field, you must begin reporting your story with an open mind toward that. That, that if, when I go out, there will be some things that I believe that will be validated. There will be some things that I believe that will, I will have underestimated. And there will be some things that I believe that will be untrue. So that that allows you to come back with a, with a complete story. So you go out with an idea, but you build on that. And in some cases, it means you need to change your mind. So, so the, the, the piece that I've given you, um, I'll, point, I'll point some things to you as we get to them. But one of the things I want to do is really to start to lay out for you what the, story of a structure, uh, the structure of a story looks like. So, uh, and, and how it sort of flows through. So that you'll know, because, because, because news stories, and, 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 and let me say this, so, so I, I'll, I'll try to remember to always say it, but when I say news stories, uh, I'm talking about, in general, all kinds of news stories, and I'm talking about uh, film scripts as well. So they are, they're, they're are basic building blocks to, to, uh, to, your, to your stories, to the stories that you're going to tell. And so as a storyteller, you want to understand the, how, basically how to, how to, uh, how to uh, construct your story. So, so just, just as a person who is going to, to, to construct a building designs that building first, you want to be able to design your story first. Okay. Now, now some of this is done fairly quickly. In the, in, in, in when you're actually out working on it. But, but it, in particularly in feature writing, you want to take the time to, to sort of create a structure for what you're going to, you're going to work on. And then you go out and you, you follow the reporting. So, um, so here's the thing. News stories in all media uh, share some common elements. And, and this is whether, whether it's, it's uh, broadcast news, online news, print for newspapers or magazines, um, they all follow some, have some common elements. Every news story is based on one main idea. So we've talked about the focus of finding the focus of your story. That's what we were talking about last night. Finding the focus of your story. It, it's based on one main idea. That is the focus of your story. So when you, so, so when you uh, come back to me as your editor and you say, I want to write a story about, you have to know what is the story about because that's what you have to tell me. And then you have to convey that. Once you start telling your story, you must convey that to your readers or your listeners or your viewers. You must always say, and, and, and not in so many words, but you must always tell people what the story is about. Because as a, as a, as a person who is a consumer of the content that you have created, you know, I, I'm always thinking, why should I care about this? Why should I care about this? And so I'll, I'll, I'll go online, and most, I get most of my news from online. I, I, I perhaps should be embarrassed to say I don't take a printed newspaper anymore. But I read lots of news. I, I get up in the morning, and I turn my computer on, and the first thing that I do is start to read news stories. And, I, and off and on during the day, I'm constantly reading news stories. And much of what I do on my Facebook page is post news stories. So, so, uh, so I'm, I'm one of those people who is sort of an information, you know, uh, an, an information junkie, if you will. I, I love finding out things. And, and they're things that just, for whatever reason, interest me. And so I get up in the morning, and I turn my computer on, and I start looking for, for news and information that interests me. And I'll see lots of things that I simply pass by, because, when, because the people that you will be uh, creating content for will make a decision in an in, in, in instant about whether they are going to proceed to read your story or watch your video 
or, or watch your film. They will make a decision in an instant. And, 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 and I mean like that. They, they see it and they decide right then and there, I, I, I don't care about this. And so that's how, that's, that's what it means to, to you as a storyteller to bring people into your story. Is that that's how much time you have to convince them that I'm, I'm, I have created something that you should be interested in. You've got that much time. So every, every new story is based on a one main idea, that's the element, I mean the focus. The basic news story structure includes a headline and three general parts, okay? A headline and three general parts. The, the first part is the beginning, which in journalism we call the lead. The second part is the middle of the story, which we call the body of the story. And then there's an ending. Every story should have some sort of conclusion. And we talked a little bit about, about headlines and someone asked me the other night about, about thinking of the headline before you actually create your story, uh, which I think sometimes is a good idea because if you, sometimes when you have a lot of information, and particularly when you've gathered lots of information, uh, thinking of how would I headline my story, and it doesn't necessarily have to end up that way, how would I headline my story gets you to thinking about how you will present your story, okay? So the headline is at the top of the story. The reason it's important is because it tells the readers what your story is about. In that instant, the reader looks at that and, and decides, Here's what the story is about. Now, very often in journalism, particularly if you work for a news organization, if you work for a newspaper, you know, I, I spent a lot of years working for this. I worked in newspapers. I worked for television stations. I worked in radio for a bit. I, I, I spent a, lo a lot of years working for the Associated Press. If you work for a news agency, you most likely will not write the headline for your story, okay? But you want to be involved in that process to the extent that you can, and so what I suggest to writers, always, is write a suggested headline for your story. Because you want to tell people what your story, you want to be the one who tells people what your story is about. Because very often, I've worked with editors who, who read my story and they were writing a headline for it to put in the paper or to put online or to send out on the wire, and, and they came away with a different, uh, a different idea of what my story was than I did. And, and, and that's useful because it really says to you whether or not you have achieved what you set out to do. So the headline usually identifies the focus, and that's especially true in online stories because most of the time in online stories, we click on the headline to read the story. The headline is what we see. So, so if I'm reading, and, I, and that's, that's where I get most of my news, I, I, uh, I, I will, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Um, I used to, the, 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 uh, the, there's of course the big newspaper from New York City, the New York Times, and I can take that. And then there's a newspaper in, in New Jersey where I live called the Star Ledger. And the Star Ledger is one of the biggest newspapers in the United States, actually. And they cover New Jersey, uh, they, they cover the entire state of New Jersey. And um, I, I was taking the Star Ledger, and the truth of the matter is I wasn't reading the paper, you know. Um, they would throw in the New York Times on my front door, at my front door, and they would throw in the Star Ledge at my front door. And there's a local newspaper in, where I live in Jersey City that covers Jersey City, the towns of Hoboken and Weehawken, and some, uh, the, the towns nearby where I live. And so I was taking all three of those newspapers. And then I, I, I reached a point with the New York Times where I thought, I don't read the newspaper, and I can get this information online. So I switched that to online. Now, then I thought, I don't need to, to take the Jersey Journal, which is my local newspaper, because I can get that online. But I had continued to take the Star Ledger, which is a big, big, widely circulated newspaper, and it covers all of New Jersey. And so I was going on vacation to Mexico, and I, I had lost my wallet. And so they were charging the newspaper to, to my debit card. 
And so I'd had my, a, a couple of days before I went on vacation, I lost my wallet. I had to get my bank to rush me a new debit card and new credit cards. So um, when the Star Ledger tried to charge me the next time for the, for the newspaper, I, I'd had a new card that they, that they didn't have. So they called me and said, we need your new credit card information. And I said, I don't read it anyway. I don't even read it online. And I said, you know, I think this is a good time for me to just stop taking it. And I think that's, that's, that's important as a journalist to me. For one thing, I felt guilty as a journalist. I thought I should be taking my local newspaper, except there was nothing in it that I felt related to me. And by the time I read that newspaper, the things that were in it that I thought were relevant to me, I'd already read. And that's what you have to do. As, as, as a journalist, as a filmmaker, you always have to think, by the time my story or my film is published, will it be relevant? So anyway, online, the first thing people see is the headline. They click on that, um, and that's what we go to. So what you want to do is, is use that headline as a tool for yourself. And if you are having trouble identifying the main point of your story, as I talked about the other night, then think of how you would write a headline for it. Okay, so the, the next part of this, the, the, the first part of the story I talked about is the lead. So how many of you are actually familiar with the term lead? Okay, so I want, so I want to be, so um, the beginning of, so if you see a news story, the beginning of every news story, the very first paragraph in that story is called a lead, okay? So the lead is sort of the thing that tells you as the reader, or tells me as the reader of your story, what the story is about. Now, the, I've said the headline does that, but the lead really starts to explain it to me. So you've written a story. The lead of your story begins to explain to me what your story is about. And a good lead draws me as a reader into your story and then entices me to continue reading beyond that point. Now, see, so here's the thing. So years ago when I first started journalism school, one of the things they told us that that is still true today in journalism, that there are sort of three types of readers. That's what they call the three-second reader. Okay, The three-second reader reads the headline in the first paragraph of your story. You know, and then there are a lot of people who just scan the headlines. So, but those aren't readers. If they scan a headline and they pass your story by, we don't count them as a reader of your story. Okay? So, but there are three basic kinds of readers. The, 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 um, the, the three-second reader reads the lead to your story, and they decide at that point whether it's relevant to them and whether they want to read any farther. The 30-second reader reads farther into your story. So there's, a, there's the, 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 the three-second, the 30-second. The 30-second reader reads into your story and starts to read more about it. And then there's a three-minute reader who effectively reads your whole story. And you have to write your story for all of those people. And, and that actually is part of the reason for the inverted pyramid. Because for that, that three-second reader, you want to tell them what the story is about. Because in today's busy world, sometimes that's about all the time people have to spend with one story. And then you want, to, you want to give more information to other people. So a good lead draws the reader into your story and then entices that reader to continue reading. In a hard news story, so we've talked about hard news stories. In a hard news story, the lead is usually written in one sentence, in a single sentence. It's the first sentence of the story. It gives the most important information uh, about the event or whatever it is that you're writing about. If you've covered a news conference, if you've covered an accident, if you've covered a shooting, if you've covered a meeting, uh, anything like that. What we consider hard news, something where you, you, it's, it's an immediate thing. So the lead tells us what that's about. So we'll talk a little bit more as we go along about how to write different kinds of leads for hard stories, but, but that's basically what it's about. So the most, type, the most common type of lead for news stories is called a summary lead. The, a summary lead summarizes the main points of your story, and it tells the reader what's happened. And we do that in the first sentence. It answers those questions that we talked about. Who, what, when, where, why, how. We do that in that first sentence. So, so that's the basic rule. You want your lead to tell people who, what, when, where, why, how. Now, as, as I've said before, for every rule, there's an exception to it. You, you want to generally think in that term. 
But you, sometimes you can't always do that. And if you are, in, in hard news stories, we sometimes, um, we, we, in hard news stories, we want to be mindful not to make the, lead, the sentence too long. Because if you write, you know, sometimes you'll see people who write very long sentences, very complex sentences, and, and they'll you know, with, with connect things with, with uh, words like and or or and things like that. So we want to avoid doing that. We want to avoid writing, writing very long, very complex leads. So if you try, sometimes if the lead gets too long and gets too cumbersome and gets too complex, people will stop reading it. So that three second reader won't read the entire thing and they won't read the rest of your story because they believe it's difficult to read. So part of what you want to do as, as, as a storyteller is to make it simple for people to read. You want, it, you want the information to be easy for people to get to. So, so generally speaking, we want our lead to say who, what, when, where, why, and how. And then the rest of your story then goes on to, to elaborate, to explain the what, the, the why, and the how. But we do not want our leads to be so cumbersome and so difficult that they become difficult to read. So, so shorter leads where we can answer those questions are, are the better way to do it. Now, now, there is no hard and fast rule for this, but I'm going to suggest to you that try your best not to write a lead that's more than 35 words. And 35 words. Try to, try to make it no more than 35 words. And if you can make it shorter than that, then that's fine. And this is, we're talking about hard news now. So, so it's, it's, it's not a requirement, but it's just something to keep in mind. That if I'm getting beyond this, then my lead is probably going to be too long. So as a writer, it's your job to decide which elements are the most important parts to stress in the story. So, so that's you, the storyteller. This is your role as a storyteller. So I've told you before, you've got, so you've got this person whose story you are telling. You've got this audience that you're delivering it to. But your role is the storyteller. You're the intermediary between those two, those two sets of people. So your job is, to, is to, to tell people what's important here, and then to give them the details that are necessary. So, on, the, on the, the, the sheet that I handed you, the first thing says summary lead. Remember our little story about the woman the other night? An elderly woman waiting at a bus stop was injured Tuesday when she was attacked by a man who grabbed her purse and attempted to escape before he was subdued by three onlookers. So what's the who? The woman. What? When? Tuesday. Where? Bus stop. So you, you see how, this, how the lead of this story sort of lays out the answers all those questions? And, and you see how few words it actually does that in. So what we want to do when we're writing about hard news things, and, and if it's an incident like this, if it's a crime, if it's an accident, if, and again, those, all those things I talk about, if it's a meeting, if it's a news conference, you know, uh, those kinds of things, then you, if, you, if you've, you've covered some, um, some session of a legislative body of some kind, or some kind of deliberative body, if you've been to a college campus to cover a speech, any of those things, those are hard news stories. And so this is what you do, this is the type of lead you want to write, is this summary lead, where you sort of, in as few words as you possibly can, answer those questions for people. Who, what, when, where, why, how. And then the rest of your story begins to explain to people what, what, uh, uh, what, what, what has happened. So the next kind of lead, which is important to you in this class, is the feature lead. A feature lead starts with a story description about a person about a place or an incident. So it doesn't begin with this, you know, the, the sort of, so we talk about a person here. But feature lead starts with some sort of description of something. And it begins with a description of something or someone that is important to, the, the, to your audience. So here's the difference. A feature lead does not immediately explain the focus of your story. So, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's sort of this descriptive lead. It's a description about a person, about a place, about uh, an incident. 
It's, someone, it's about somebody who's important to your story, and it does not necessarily explain the focus of your story. But in a future lead, we want to do, we, we want to use some kind of a device where we actually sort of, sort of uh, draw people into the story. We want to s more slowly draw them into the story. And so you as a storyteller use an anecdotal lead, and this is a, this, anecdotal leads, are they, and anecdotes are good for starting film, for, for films as well, by the way. So the, the anecdote, in effect, te tells a, a small piece of that person's story. Because your idea is to make people interested in this person, this place, this thing, this circumstance. So you want to you want to you want to tell them a little bit, just enough to sort of draw them in. And then you here's the thing: when you do, because I said a, a, a feature lead may not tell people the focus of your story. So a feature lead always has to be always has to be followed with a paragraph that tells people what your story is about. Okay. Richard Brown was always bothered that in order to make a profit from his family's 150-year-old chicken farm, he had to raise birds so contaminated with salmonella that they easily made people sick when not carefully handled during preparation and cooking. Does that answer all five of those six, six of those questions for you? Who, what, when, where, why, how? Does it answer all of those? It does not. But in a future lead, you're able to do this. But what you have to do, once you have done that, is you have to come back and begin to answer those questions for your audience. So Brown convinced a few of his fellow farmers in central Mississippi. There's the where. The where's in the second paragraph. So Brown convinced a few of his fellow farmers in central Mississippi that they could raise chickens that were not full of the bacteria that sickens thousands around the country each year and still make money. The cooperative they formed has now developed a chicken the USDA says carries 90% less bacteria than most birds now sold in grocery stores, and the farmers can still earn a healthy profit. The USDA, by the way, is a US government agency. It's the US Department of Agriculture, the United States Department of Agriculture, and, and they, they're responsible for food safety in the United States. So sometimes they do a better job than others, sometimes not so much, but, but, uh, but, but they sort of, it's the agency that sort of keeps tabs on this sort of thing. Okay, so, so Brown convinced a few of his fellow farmers in central Mississippi. Here's our where. Central Mississippi. That they could raise chickens that were not full of the bacteria that sickens thousands around the country. This, this, so, so that's the why there. Why do they want to do this? Why are they doing it? They wanted to raise chickens that didn't make everybody sick and still make money. So we get to the why there. So here's the how. The cooperative they formed has now developed a chicken. The USDA says carries 90% less bacteria than most birds now sold in grocery stores. That's, that, 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 that's the how. So we've gotten, so between these two sentences, we've gotten into everything. We've answered all of our questions. The who is Richard Brown? The what is that he wanted to raise birds that weren't contaminated with bacteria and made people sick. The where is down in the second paragraph. They, so you start, so this is, this is, this is how, you, how you build, this is how you start to build a feature story. Because what you want to do is sort of draw people into the story. You want to entice them into the story. You want to make it interesting for them. So, so what you want to do is, is say, you know, when you, when you write a hard news lead, as the summary lead as you did in the first one, Basically, what you're saying to people, I have a set of facts, and my role as a storyteller is to deliver that set of facts to you as quickly as I possibly can. In a feature lead, what you basically want to say to your readers or to your listeners or to your viewers is that I want you to take a journey with me. You know, and, and this, is the, this feature lead is how we are more likely to tell stories to each other. So when, when you tell stories to your friends about something that's interesting, so when, so when I go back to the United States, everybody that I know will ask me about Ethiopia, right? So I'll start to tell them stories about you and about the people I've met, about the, the things that I've done, what I've seen, about the sights, about the traffic, about, the, you know? So, so, uh, so what we do is we, we, start, we tell people stories. 
And so, so this device allows you to start building a story that you tell to people. So we want to do this sort of descriptive thing, but remember, you, this, is, this anecdotal lead basically sort of tells you this guy's story, right? So I think that's a good tool, but you want, it's, it's a very good tool for you to use in feature writing, but you, but you don't want to overdo it, okay? And, and one of the things that's, that's happened sometimes in feature writing is that people like this anecdotal lead, and so they write every story with an anecdotal lead. So if you were writing about a chicken farm and this guy who, what other things could you start your story talking about? But basically what you want to do, if you walk around a place, so, so you're gonna, you will have spent time here. You, you will have spent time here. You will, have seen, so you, will, you will have seen the places where they raise chickens. And so what we, write, what we talk about, what we write about, is a thing that strike us as being out of the ordinary. About the ordinary. Because people raise chickens and we eat them and, you know. So, so, so but, but what we're struck by and what, what has actually shocked a lot of people in the United States is how chickens are raised. Because everybody could kind of thought there are these farms and there are chickens all over the ground. So a lot of these birds never touch the ground. They, they never see grass or dirt or bugs or any of that stuff. They're, they're born in these, they're born in these uh, breeding houses and they live their lives there. The lights are always on. There's always food in front of them. You know, at night, chickens are like other birds. They go to roost. So, which, which would be an interesting thing to, to sort of peg it on. So, maybe if I were writing an anecdotal lead about this, so, so the chicken, so, so we all know birds roost at night, right? They all, they all go to roost and they go to sleep. Well, keeping the lights on all night means the birds never go to sleep. They never go to sleep. So, so I might talk about the birds at, at, uh, at, at Rich Brown's farm never sleeping. So the word graph, I'll start with that. This is just uh, uh, a, uh, a colloquialism, if you will, of the word paragraph. That, that's all it is. It's just, it's just a shorthand, um, a shortened version, if you will, of the word paragraph. So, so when, if when you hear journalists, particularly Western journalists, talk about uh, how many graphs of that story? They're not talking about a graph like we, we follow chart things. They're talking about how many graphs is it about the, about the nut graph, about the penultimate graph, about whatever. They're talking about the paragraphs in the story. It's, just, it's as simple as that. So the nut me is, is that there's sort of this colloquialism in, in American English, of course, that, that, um, that the, when you, when you, you know, most, most nuts grow in shells of some kind. So when you open it up, you've gotten to the heart of it, you've gotten to the center of it. So the nut really means that this is, this is the, you've gotten to the, you've cracked through the outer shell of it and you've gotten to the center of it, you've gotten to the meaning of it. That's what, that's, so the nut graph means that you've gotten to the real meaning of the story. That's what the nut graph is. It explains to people what the real meaning of the story is. So it states the focus of your story. It talks about the main point. It should tell, in a nutshell, that's the, ter the American term, it tells in a nutshell what the story is about and why it is newsworthy. So in, in my story about this chicken farmer, um, why, is it, why is it news, why would it be newsworthy to Americans? Why would it be newsworthy? Let's spectate, it's not gonna make, I, finally there's a chicken that, that I, can, I can eat that's not gonna make, that I, I can feel confident is not gonna make me sick. I don't have to, when I, when I cut up my chicken, you know, there's, there, in, in American stores, so, so in American grocery stores, for those of you who've never been in one and never seen one, so if you buy a chicken, it goes through a processing plant. So the chicken has been cleaned and it's been beheaded and the feet are taken off and all this stuff, generally speaking. And, and, and it's been gutted and all this stuff. So it's, it's pretty much ready to take to your house and cut up and cook. Although you can buy chickens that are already cut up. But, but, so, but if you cut up the chicken, and I said this the other night, you, you've got to then kind of scour your kitchen down because it spread all this bacteria all over your kitchen. So the important thing here is I don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about it making me sick if it happens to be slightly undercooked. Because most Americans eat beef about half raw. And I notice people here do eat it raw. But you can't do that with chickens. 
Actually, there's some Americans who eat it raw too. But, but, um, but, but you can't do that with chicken. So, so the, the nut graph, which gets to the heart of our story, gets the nut, tells us why this story is, is news. So in a, in a hard news story, you don't necessarily have to have a nut graph because your lead has already told you what the story is about and why it's news. So if you go back to our summary lead, you already know from reading that first sentence why it's news. But if you only read the first paragraph of our feature lead, it, it doesn't say to you why it's news. Okay, so, so he was bothered by this and, you know, so, so what? Now, here's the other thing. The nut graph should be placed high in your story. It doesn't always have to be the second paragraph, but it should be high in your story. It should be somewhere in, in, in from the second, third, fourth, fifth paragraph. If you've gotten past five paragraphs and you've not told your reader or, or your listener or your viewer why this is news, you are probably going to lose them, or you may have already lost them. Because news has to connect with people. And that's why I said all storytelling is about people. All journalism is about people. So you've got to tell me the, why this is important to me. OK? So, so um, I'm going to go to the, so on your, on your handout, you see the, the piece that says nut graph. Now, this is a story off the AP wire from yesterday, I believe it was. Um, at, uh, at the edge of a Balkan vineyard, Mohammed al Hajj lay down under a tree to collect his thoughts. Come nightfall, he and other Syrians with him, this is about the, the Syrian uh, refugee problem, he and other Syrians with him would make a run for it, past the fence of chain link and barbed wire being built along the Hungarian border to keep them out, past the armed border guards. It was a make or break moment in a journey across the continent. In the last few hours, he'd, he'd case the border, planning how they would make their dash through the fields from Serbia into Hungary. His mind was racing. Had he missed anything? His vision drifted up to the late afternoon sky, crisscrossed by the white streams of passenger jets. He watched one plane go by, then another, then another, full of normal passengers on normal voyages. He thought of the life he was certain he would reach in Germany. One day soon, I'll travel by planes like those, he mused. The dreams of normalcy after a life destroyed by Syrian civil war had sustained the 26-year-old throughout his journey across the Aegean Sea where others like him had drowned. Through miles of walking under hot sun, through rain and muddy fields, crowded train stations and long bus rides, lack of sleep, confusion, impatience, and exhaustion, fear and anger, the constant barrage of every emotion except one. Never despair, never a moment of despair or surrender. Muhammad's voyage was part of an historic movement as humanity, of, of humanity as more than 600,000 migrants this year have crossed land and sea, seeking sanctuary in Europe. Countries there have been struggling to cope with the biggest wave of migration since World War II. Their shifting policies and the ensuing chaos have forced migrants to find new routes to northern Europe, where even the richest stations, nations are now signaling that they, know they want to deter what they view as an unwanted overflow of migration. So what's the nut graph in that story? The nut graph in the story is actually the very last one. It's actually the very last one. Muhammad's voyage was part of an historic movement of humanity as more than six, here's the news, as more than 600,000 migrants this year have crossed land and sea, seeking sanctuary in Europe. Countries there have been struggling to cope with the biggest wave of migration since World War II. The shifting policies and the ensuing chaos have forced migrants to find new routes to Northern Europe, where even the richest nations are now struggling signaling that they want to deter what they view as an unwanted overflow of immigrants. That's the paragraph that tells you what the story is about. So, so the, others, the others are interesting pieces of the story, and they are pieces that are intended to draw you in. So, so and I'll, I'll go through it a little bit more. You know, if you notice, so that's one, two, three, that's, that's more than five paragraphs in, but it's about five or six paragraphs in. But, but what this writer has done is sort of try to paint a picture for you. So, so some of the words are right here. It was a, now, now um, some of this is 
this is, this is obviously a story that's written for an American audience. It was a make or break moment in a journey across the continent. In the last hours, he crossed, he cased the border, planning how they would make their dash through the fields from Serbia into Hungary. His mind was racing. He had, had he missed anything? So what's the purpose of that paragraph? Your role as a storyteller is to take this person's story and share it with this person, right? So what's the purpose of that? This, this paragraph tells us what he's feeling. It tells us what he's feeling. In the last hours, he cased a border, planning how they would make their dash through the fields from Serbia into Hungary. His mind was racing. This is, tell, this is, this is what he's going, it sort of tries to put you in his, in, 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 in his mindset. So that's what you want to do as a feature writer. That's what you want to do as a documentarian, is you want to make your audience feel something. But it's not your story to tell. It's somebody else's. So that's what this writer is doing. He's trying to get you to see what this person is going through. And, 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 and here's the thing. So, so if, if this is an AP writer who's writing for an audience in the United States, they see this on television, and this, they sort of pass it by. You know, it's, it's an interesting story. But here's a paragraph that tells people sitting in their living rooms back at home, watching their 60-inch flat-screen televisions, what's actually going on in these people's minds. This is, all stories are about people. This is the people side of this story. This is the human element to this story. His vision drifted up to the late afternoon sky, crisscrossed with the white streams of passenger jets. This sets a scene for us. It paints a picture for us. So, so I when I talk to you about the, the chicken house, I've, and, you know, and, and, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, it's telling people about sights and sounds and smells and the, what you feel. Those are things you want to put into, into stories. You need to, your, your audience needs to, to smell what you have smelled. If you walk into a place and it stinks, tell them it stinks. Tell them what it smells like. And then not just say it stinks, but try to, try to describe what, what it smells like. If you walk into some place and, and, and let, let's say you walk into a garden and what you see is this burst of color and you see reds and blues and yellows and oranges and whatever else, tell your readers that. If the sidewalks are neatly you know, laid out, if the grass is cut, You know, so Americans are big on growing lawns, right, and having gardens. And, and, and so when you cut the grass, there's a smell. So if, let's say somebody has just cut the grass, and you, you've been in this garden, and you've got all these flowers around. So you have all these fragrances of the flowers. You know, jasmine smells one way. Roses smell a different way. You know, um, uh, camellia smell a certain way. All, they all smell a particular way. So let's say you're writing a story about someone. So one of the big things in, in the United States right now is people growing community gardens in urban areas, like big cities like, like Addis. So in, the, in, in places in New York City where there are vacant lots, people have taken over those vacant lots, and, and the city allows them to take over these vacant lots, and they grow gardens. They grow food. Because one of the problems with, with, with young people, children who grow up in urban areas, they really don't know where the food comes from. And there, there, are, there are, by the way, grocery stores in New York City that where there, there are neighborhoods in New York City and in places like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. And, and here's America, the richest country in the world. There are places where children never see any fresh fruit and vegetables. So in a lot of places like that, in New York City, you will be in, you will be in an inner city neighborhood in Harlem or up in the Bronx where all those tall buildings and concrete and asphalt and fences, and then you'll come to a place where there's a big garden and they're growing vegetables. How can you not be struck by that? So if you were writing a story about that, if you're writing a script about that, what you want to, what, what would strike me about it is here are all these tall buildings. Here, here are these busy streets jammed with cars. You know, people walking up and down the streets a lot. New Yorkers walk a lot. Much the, way, much the way they do in Addis. And so they walk a lot. It's a very pedestrian city. 
So you see all these people, their playgrounds, their children playing, you know, their, their police officers over here. So you see all these things, and in the middle of all of this is a garden with food growing. So if I were writing about that, I would sort of describe that scene. You know, these, these tall buildings around and all the concrete. Car, you know, New Yorkers are forever blowing their horns in traffic. That, that's one of the things, if when you go, when, and I hope you all will, when you go to New York, one of the first things you will notice when you get into the city is people constantly blow their horns. So, so there's all these people blowing their horns, there are all these noises and all these sounds, and here's this peaceful little place with food growing. And so you want to contrast for people, if you're writing about this, if you're telling a story about this, you want to contrast for people why that, because that's, that's pretty striking. You've got all these tall buildings of bit bricks and concrete and concrete sidewalks and asphalt streets, you know, not much grass anywhere, people everywhere, cars blowing their horns and all these noises and it's like, and here's this peaceful, peaceful spot. And you've got, you know, you've got collard greens and you've got corn and you've got peas and you've got lettuce and you've got all these things growing in there. And there's this place and it's, you know, uh, so you've got a lot of stuff that's growing in there that's, that's green because part of the purpose is to, to, in these communities, to get leafy green vegetables into these communities. So you want to write about this. You're going to see a lot of green, but you'll see stalks of corn. So these tall stalks, corn, the, the tall stalks, the silk, the yellow silk coming out, the ears peeping outside the, the, the husk. Those are the kinds of details that you want to tell in the story. So what, what this writer is doing, his vision drifted up to the late afternoon sky, crisscrossed by the white stream, streams of passenger jets. And so, so, so this guy is thinking about it. He says, he, and this guy's looking up, and he's one day I'll travel in planes like those. So as a writer, that's a good detail for you to tell. Because for, for me as the reader of this story, I already know now by now that th here's, here's a man who has left his home because of this turmoil. He's waiting on night, nightfall, and when it's dark, they're gonna run past this chain link fence and this barbed wire and, and where people, where the armed guards are trying to keep them out to try to get to a place where they can feel more free. So we've talked about all of this that's going, all of these, these things that are going on. This, this next sentence is very telling. The dream of normalcy after a life destroyed by a serious civil war had sustained the 26-year-old throughout his journey. And somebody mentioned that paragraph. So, so that is a key paragraph in the story because it talks about the Syrian, the Syrian civil war and it talks about this man's, this man's quest for normalcy. That's all he's looking for is some sense of normalcy. But the, the nut graph in this story, the one that tells us what the story is about, the one that tells us why it's news is the last paragraph. So, so, so th this is the other thing. So we've talked a little bit about hard news and feature stories. So this is a story about conflict. It's a story about difficulty. It's a story about hardship. It's a story about fear. It's a story about all those things, but it's a feature story. And so, so one of the things we, we sometimes believe that feature stories are about sort of these nice things happening they're fun stories. Somebody said they're entertaining. You know, this is a feature story. It is hardly an entertainment story, but it is a feature story. So that's the other thing. So, so we, we write these stories where we want to uh, make sure that we, 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 we draw, we use these devices to draw the reader in. We want to paint a picture for the reader. We want to tell, you know, if, if, if now, if, if you're covering a story and you're out there and people are, are going about, uh, most of us, when it rains, so, so here's the thing about covering certain, certain kinds of stories. So, so in, early in my career, I did some, some work where I would, I would cover police agencies. And so here's the thing. Police are investigating crime scenes, and it's pouring rain, and they're out in the rain. They're just, they're just walking around in it. So that's, that's, that's something that people may not know. So you look for things that are sort of, you know, that, that are explained to people what the scene looks like, you know. Is the sun bright? Is it dark? Is it raining? Is it warm? Is it cold? You know, what do I smell? What do I see? What do I feel? 
And, and so this is one of the things about journalism. You have to learn to use all of your senses because in order to tell, in order to tell this person's story to this person, you've got to put this person in that setting. And you can only do that by giving them all, by using all of your senses. One of the things I, I will say, because I, I said you want to try to get the, the, the nut graph in the first three to five paragraphs of the story. But, but one thing, and this, this lead, if, the, if the story is very compelling, the nut graph can come later. The nut graph can come later. So the reason it works in this story is because, because you know, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paragraphs down. So this right away is until five, seven paragraphs rather than the first three or five to, to give us, to explain to us what the story about. But, but what he has done is sort of paint a picture for us and set a scene for us. So if that's what you're doing, then you can take a little bit longer to, to get into it. So, so here's the thing. So I, 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 I tell you rules sometimes. And I want, rules are to create a framework from which you can work. It's a, it creates a structure for you. But never make them rigid because the worst thing you can do to writing is, is, is rigidly follow rules. Because you, some, part of what you want to do is, is you know, and, and one of the things we talk about, you want to be attached to a story but not too attached. You, you have to remain some, some sort of detachment to a story, so, 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 which I'll back up to for a second. So in order for this writer to cover this story, he's got, he can't tell, the, tell this man's story unless he both cares about it and he's detached from it. Because if he's too emotionally involved, he can't tell you that story in this way. But he has to be attached enough to it so he can, so, so, so that's the thing. You need that attachment and back to the rules. We, we need rules because they create frameworks in which we can work. But, but you don't want to be too rigid. You want to allow yourself some freedom to, to, to build a story in a way that feels good about you and where you feel like you are serving both the subject of your story and your audience. So the next thing, the lead should be supported or backed up with facts, quotes, and statements that substantiate information in the lead. So that's what we want to do. So we, want to, so we, we give the lead, and this is true in every, in every story. So then we start to build a story around facts and, and figures. You see some stories sometimes that have numbers and things like that. So, so that's what you want to do. You, you start with, and if we, if, we were, if we were building this story, if you go back to the summary lead, an elderly woman waiting at a bus stop was injured Tuesday when she was attacked by a man who grabbed her purse and attempted to escape before he was subdued by three onlookers. So that's where you start to ask yourself all those other questions. What do my readers need to know? What does my audience need to know? So, so we've already said a where, but we, but, but we haven't talked about the neighborhood or the street corner. We haven't talked about whether it's day or whether it's night. We haven't talked about whether the street was crowded. We haven't talked about... Uh, we haven't talked about the woman very much. We said she's an elderly woman, but we don't know really how old she is. We don't know whether she's tall or short, or you know, we don't we don't know a lot of things about her. So, so uh, we don't know a lot of things about the se the setting, and so that's what we want to start to do: is support our lead by by uh, and and back it up with with facts and with quotes and with statements that that actually validate and substantiate what we've said. We want to, that that says to the readers that I've told you this fact, and now, now here's what I'm presenting to you to back it up and to sort of to tell you more about the story. A Glen Ridge man killed in a crash on the Garden State Parkway Sunday was a budding young writer honing his talents at Rutgers Newark University. Johnny Muller, 26, so that's our lead, okay? A, a Glen, so we know uh, who was the Glen Ridge man, what? Killed in a crash, where? On the Garden State Parkway, when? Sunday, okay? So I also said that, that even in a summary lead, you don't have to answer every question. So we've answered who, what, when, uh, and where, but we haven't answered the, the why and the how, okay? Johnny Muller, 26, had begun pursuing a Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing and had been working as a part-time lecturer at the school, according to Chancellor Nancy Cantor. So, so I talked to you about uh, using facts, quotes, and statements that substantiate the information. So here we go. 
Although he was brand new to our community, Johnny already, already was woven deeply into the lives of students, faculty, and staff, known for his ready smile, his humility, even while po po possessing prodigious talent as a writer in our renowned MFA creative writing program, and his infectious enthusiasm for the life of learning and teaching, she said in a statement. Okay, that's where we flesh it out with a quote. So we allow the chancellor of this university to tell us who this young man is. Because inevitably when we start writing about people who've been, been, been particularly, we want to know who they were what, and whatever we're writing about. If we're writing about people who, were, who whether it's some misfortune or some good fortune, we, we just want to know who they are because it helps us connect with them. All journalism is about humans, is about people. It helps us connect with them. Muller had come to Rutgers University after pursuing his undergraduate degree at nearby Montclair State University, where his writing, ranging from fiction to film criticism, won him praise from both classmates and faculty. Now, this isn't the whole story, so it does goes on, go on to give us more details about the accident itself. But I wanted to show you how, how uh, this writer uses um, the, this quote in particular to sort of tell us about more about this person. So if... if um, if, if, we, if, if, if we went farther into the story, what we might do is, is uh, talk about where the accident took place. So, so New, Jersey is, is, is a, has a, New Jersey is a fairly small state. And it's, 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 uh, it's sort of sandwiched, it, it, it's sort of sandwiched between um, New York, so, so there's like, uh, New York is sort of to the north and, and, and west, and then Pennsylvania is to the west and south, okay? So, and then the Atlantic Ocean is to the east. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's sort of a thin state that's sort of long going north to south, but it's only about a two hour, two, two, two and a half hour drive from the whole, north. so it's a small state. It's very densely populated, it's very diverse, kind of people from all kinds of backgrounds. It's one of the most diverse states in the United States. But, but it's, and, and, and I'm just paint a little bit of a picture for it. But um, it's sort of characterized by these two highways that sort of split the state north to south. One of them is the Garden State Parkway. And, and, um, and New, New Jersey is called the Garden State. Uh, that's because, because it, there are a lot of farms there. They grow a lot of, of food in New Jersey. Um, so the Garden State Parkway goes north, north to south, and then uh, sort of, sort of uh, um, to the west, and then sort of crisscrosses over, and then goes back, and they, they, they actually cross each other. So the Garden State Parkway sort of comes out and then goes toward the, toward the Atlantic coast, and then kind of goes down the coast. So the, the, the other big highway is the New Jersey Turnpike, which sort of, Comes out of comes out of New York, starts and and uh, and then goes down the length of the highway toward Pennsylvania. So, so um, that that those two highways are some of the most busily traveled ones in the country, and and they they, they have lots of lanes. They're very wide highways, and um, the unfortunate truth is that there's sometimes a, um, the the scenes of a lot of accidents. So so if I were writing other things about the story, you would start to talk about where the accident happened. And then you would talk about the circumstances of the accident, because it's one of the questions that's not answered. We, the, the how is not in the paragraphs that I have given, the how is not answered. So the question becomes, what happened? And so, so who would you go to to find out of what happened? In the United States, you would, you would go to, a, you would find out from some kind of law enforcement personnel who could tell you details. And so, as, as again, back to this whole notion of, um, of, of using quotes and things to tell a story. So we would probably, uh, we would probably have someone tell us where the accident happened on the Garden State Parkway and then tell us the circumstances of the accident. You know, was it raining? Uh, how crowded was the accident? Did he lose control of his car? Did someone hit him? A lot of things like that. And then you would have a quote from that, that police official that then sort of explains to you um, um, what the circumstances of the accident were. So this is basically talking about support for the lead. Now this is a hard news lead, 
But in both, in both hard news and feature leads, what you want to do is you want to basically um, lay out some kind of case supporting what it is that, you, that you've told your reader. Now, in a hard news story, you basically you come out and you use the summary lead where you tell people, you tell your audience a series of facts, a quick series of facts. You, you try to, as best you can, to answer the questions who, what, when, where, how, why, and how. You don't always get to answer those questions in the lead. Because as I said, you don't want to make your lead too complex, too cumbersome. And, and you see what this writer did? You see how, how short this, this lead is? So you don't want to make it too complex and too cumbersome. You, but, but once you've done that, then you have to come back and begin to tell a story about what happened. You have to come back and fill in the blanks. You have to, you have to explain to, to me as your reader or to whoever is in your audience what actually happened. Now, this is a story that people kind of care about in New Jersey for the simple reason that so many people drive these highways. And there's a famous comedian uh, in New Jersey called, uh, named Tracy Morgan. Um, he grew up in New York City, uh, he, um, uh, and he's very famous. He was, on a, he was on a television show, and he's a big stand-up comedian. And he was, on a, he was in an accident uh, last, toward the end of 2014 that killed a friend of his and, uh, and injured him severely, and he just sort of started making public appearances again um, on the New Jersey Turnpike. So these are stories that are that important in that particular place because a lot of us drive these highways, and, and they're very congested, and pe people drive very fast, and there they're end up being lots of accidents. So these are the kinds of things people care about. But once you start to, to, to write these stories, you lay out your quick set of facts. You, if, you, if you're doing a, a feature, you give them the nut graph that basically tells them why this is news. And then if you're writing a summary lead, then, and, and otherwise you start to lay out a series of facts that sort of explains to them what the circumstances are, that supports the story, that substantiates things. And you do this with quotes and with facts and with, with other kinds of information. So if you, want, if you have any thoughts about working for, and that's what made me think about the Associated Press style book. If you have any thoughts about working for um, um, international media, one of the best places you can start is travel writing. Because, um, so here's the thing, Americans and Europeans and Australians, the, the, the Japanese and the Koreans, are always interested in, in parts of the world that they've never been to. And so they're curious about it, they plan trips, you know, their travel agencies there to sell things. So there are all kinds of magazines, there are all kinds of newspapers, there are all kinds of news agencies that buy um, articles that have to do with travel and, 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 uh, and, and tourism. So that is something you could write now because you know this country. You, you know, so, if, so it's a good chance for you to talk about your country. And we, you know, we started off talking about changing the narrative about Ethiopia and about Africa. Here's a chance for you to start doing that. It's through travel writing. So, so, it's, it's, uh, so in, in travel writing, what you want to do is, is all the things that I just talked about. You want to tell a story. You know? You know, so, so if you are, are writing about Addis Ababa that you want to tell me, someone who's never been here, you want to think in terms of why would anyone who's never been here want to come? Except they don't know why they should come, but you know why they should. But you, so here's the thing. So you have to put yourself in the mindset of the person that you're, you're, that you're trying to tell about this place. So here's an opportunity for you to tell them about it. And in, in travel writing, what they need to know is where to stay, where not to stay, what, where to visit. So things like museums and, and mosques and churches and cathedrals, um, um, you know, anything like that, places where, where, where you know that tourists would enjoy seeing, um, you tell them about those places. And so you need to be familiar with them yourself. So if I went to, if I went to the National Museum, what would I see? If I visited Addis University, what would I see? If I walked up and down the streets, what would I see? What would I smell? Um, you know, what would people, the people be like? What neighborhoods are friendly? What neighborhoods are safe? You know, what are hotels that, you know, are there, are, what are the hotels like? And, and it's, it's interesting, people have asked me what the hotel is like that I'm staying in. I was like, well, it's like a hotel in New York or London or 
anywhere else. So, so people, but people really don't know. And so, so you cannot assume that they know. So this is an opportunity for you to do that. So the other thing is, is particularly if you shoot pictures, travel stories always need photographs. And so, so the good thing is you want the best quality photographs that you can get, obviously, but, but you must have some kind of good photographs to go along with your story. Uh, so the kinds of things that people, so I can tell you what, if, if, if what, I can tell you what I'll talk, to, talk about when I go back. Because uh, a lot of people have asked me about the hotel. So you tell them about the hotel. Uh, I've walked through some of the neighborhoods. Um, so I, I've, I, I was fascinated by the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the coffee ritual, by the butchers on the streets, uh, by um, you know, the, the merchants, um, by the buses, the, the traffic, um, things like that. So you write about things like that that create a scene and create a place for people. And so I'm going to do some sightseeing this weekend, so I'll, I, can, I can talk about that. So I'll, I want to see the cathedral and the museum and some other. So we're going to go to a market tomorrow because I wanted to do that too. So uh, and I want to buy some Ethiopian coffee. So um, so you can you can tell people things like that, and 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 their their question is what is a hotel? And literally, practically everybody said, what is a hotel like? Well, the the hotel is like staying in any world class hotel in New York or Los Angeles. Or, or you know, any other or Toronto or any number of other places where I've, I've visited. So, so that people need to know. So tell people what to expect. Tell them what's because if I were to, if I were going to tell you about New York, if you ask me what to do and what not to do in New York, so I would tell you about the museums. Um, I would tell you about the museums. I would tell you about the restaurants and the food. I would tell you. Uh, about the times of day that it's best to go places. I would tell you that, uh, that it's hard to get a taxi at 6 o'clock. I would tell you to make sure the taxi driver uses a meter. I would tell you know, things like that, um, I, uh, especially in Washington, D.C. So things like that, so that you know. I would tell you um, that, there, that these are places that you will feel comfortable, that, that you Things like that. So that's what you want to do. I would also tell you places that there are some communities that you may not feel comfortable or safe and to avoid, and I might mention some of those. So think in terms of who you, who you, who you, and, and, and photographs, 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 photographs. And too many photographs is, is, the, is how many you want to send. You want to send to, and let and let the editors that you're and so so a lot of this so so the people who buy those include airline magazines. So, uh, so uh, Ethiopian Airlines is in a in a airline partnership called the Star Alliance. Okay, the U.S. airline United Airlines is part of it. The German I came in here on the German airline Lufthansa. They're part of it. British Airways is part of it. Um, lots, lots. So those they and they all they all have magazines. And so, so if you could you know so uh, so I, I I flew out of Newark Airport. Uh, I've changed planes in, in, uh, in Frankfurt, and I flew on, on to here. So, so you can tell people that. Um, and, uh, so, but, but, but the United Airlines magazine is the sort of place that you can sell those kinds of stories. Okay, And then tra travel, they're all kind of travel magazines, they travel websites, they're all kind of places like that. And that's a place where you can start to actually you know, hone your journalism and make a little money at it at the same time. So someone else asked me, I talked about the number of words to use in a lead. Uh, and this was an important question. So, um, and, and someone, so one, one of the gentlemen who came up to talk to me said someone else had said 20 to 25 words. So if I say 35 words, somebody will say 30 words. Somebody will say 25 words. Somebody will say 20 words. So, so what I've tried to impress on you and what I want to impress on you is that, that rules about writing are intended to create a, a framework, a set of building blocks from which you can work. They are never intended to be rigid. So if I tell you 35 words, somebody else will tell you 25. So which one is right? And that's kind of what he asked, which one is right? Well, they're both right. But, but, but I don't want to tell anybody, you can only write 35 words, or you should always write 35 words. What I want to tell people is I'm trying to give you a framework in which you can work. And at the end of the day, when you write a lead for your story, say everything you need to say. 
but no more than you need to say. And one of the things I said to him is when, when I was a reporter, I, I spent more time on my lead than I did any other part of the story. And much of the time, uh, I, it would take me as long to really craft a lead that I liked as it would to write the rest of the story. Because once you get, here's the thing about writing hard news stories in particular. Once you get your lead written, the rest of the story just sort of flows behind it. So that's where you want to spend your time. So you want to be careful about your lead. There are no hard and fast rules. You know, whatever anybody tells you, if somebody told you 25 words, I, I, I'm not disputing the 25 words. But what I'm telling you, never get locked into a number. Use no more words than you need to use. You know, years ago, and I said this to him, when, uh, when I was a young reporter, a year or so out of college, people were saying um, no more than 10 words. And then it went back to 20 words. And so it's sort of been all over the map. You know, and it's, it's almost like a fad. You know, but my whole thing is, you, if, when leads become too complex, you lose your readers. And that's why I'm suggesting that you limit the number of words. So I said 35, somebody will say 25. So, so for me, it's not about the number of words that you use. It's about the clarity of what you write. So make sure that you use as many words as you need, but no more words than you need. If, if, you, if, if you have written 25 words and you only need 24 words, cut that one word out. Take it out. So, so, so but if you've, if you've written 17 words and you're proud because I've written a short lead, you know, but you read it and you think something's missing here, then you need to add some words to it because that's the only way you can tell. The only way we can tell stories is through words. So we want to use as many words as we can, and that's the problem with, with being rigid about the number of words. And, and, and I, so I'm probably spending too much time on this, but I feel like you can't overemphasize it. Do not get locked into a number because nothing ruins good writing like rigid rules. Part of what makes a good story a story is to, this is, you know, we talk about context, is to provide details, reference points. So, so if one, a natural question to ask, we've got 600,000 Syrian refugees trying to get into other countries to, to live. So to try to live and norm, live normal lives. So the question becomes, when was the last time this happened? Okay. So when, 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 uh, when U.S. writers wrote about what happened in Rwanda a number of years ago, um, there was an effort to try to put some sort of perspective on that. And, and I'm not sure that they did a, the best job of it, but some did better than others, I should say. Some news organizations did better than others. Uh, but what... But so whenever you cover something like this where the lives of, of large groups of people are affected, it, it, you, you want to think in terms of when has anything else like this happened? When you, when you look at, if you are writing about any event that, that seems to you in some way to be momentous, that, that, that you feel like history is being created here, you really need to ask yourself, is history being created here? And so you put a reference point in your story to give that to that compares it to something. So when was the last time something like this happened? You know. So now I, I might dispute this story in some ways uh, because I think it sort of ignores a lot of the refugee situations that occurred in Africa, and 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 and, uh, and which Westerners have a tendency to do. But um, but but uh, but at any rate, he, at any rate, he tries to create a reference point. And that's, that, that's what, it, that's what the, the goal is, is not to encourage it or discourage it one way or another, but simply create a reference point. And that's, that's what he's doing. He's comparing it to, to what he believes is the last time something happened. Your job as a, as, a, as a feature writer is to add elements to the story that actually show a perspective. You know, you, want, you do want people, you know, um, so if, if, you, if you are writing a story at Addis Univers University about a scientist who has discovered some new, um, you know, chemical process? Okay, the the question the, then the question becomes, you know, how new is it really? So you start looking for things to reference it to, you know, and even when was the last time this university did it? When I, you know, so when people do things that feel like it's they make they're making history, what you need to do as a writer is to say to people, it is to create a reference point that says, yes, they are, yes, they are, they are not. You know, because sometimes you, 
Sometimes things are, are interesting for, the sake, for their own sake. But sometimes things really are, it, it is really something significant is happening here. And, and, and part of your job as a writer is to, to recognize that there is something significant happening here. And to, to create reference points for people so that they understand the significance of it. If you want your stories to have impact. What does that mean? What influence does it have over people's lives? How does it, how does it affect people? What difference does it make in people's lives? When you, when in feature journalism, and, and this is one of the things I love about documentary, I, I point to you a lot because I know you're a documentary, and there probably are others of you, I just happen to know that you are. This is one of the things I love about documentary filmmaking is because it's all about things that are, are about what really has affected people's lives. And so whenever you write a feature story, even, even when it, if, you, if you're writing a, a, a story about a farm or about a meat market or about whatever it is. You know, the question becomes, what effect does it have on people's lives? What influence does it have on people's lives? So, so the impact of the story that I wrote about the chicken farmer, the impact is that it, it, it gives people a product that they didn't have before that creates a level of safety that they didn't have or actually a product that they had, but it creates, gives them a safe version of a product that they've had access to that's a part of a staple diet. So, so that's, that's impact. What difference does it make in people's lives? How does it influence them? How does it inf affect them? That's something that is, as storytellers, that we all have to think about. Is, and and it's, 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 it's the question that you have to ask yourself every time you write a story. What is the impact of what I'm doing? What is the significance of it? You know, and so in, in this story about the, the refugee, you know, where he says, Muhammad's voyage was part of a historic, an historic movement of humanity as more than 600,000 immigrants this year have crossed land and sea, seeking sanctuary in Europe. Countries there have been struggling to cope with the biggest wave of immigrants since World War II. So they're not seeing anything in Europe like this since World War II. That's impact. That's, that's, that's the impact of the story. So if you live in Germany, or if you live in Serbia, or if you live in Croatia, or if you live in Austria, if you live in Turkey, there is no way that you cannot be influenced by this story. Because you are somehow going to encounter some of these people who are now coming into this country. So, so um, the, the immigration story that's big in the United States right now is the story of, of, of Mexican immigrants coming into the, in, in the United States and the question of whether they're coming in legally. So, so you've got Mexico is, there are the parts of Mexico that are very prosperous, the parts of Mexico that are very poor, and every country is that way, by the way. There are parts of Mexico where there, is a, there are huge drug cartels that are, are, are literally fighting wars, and I mean real wars, with, with machine guns and tanks and artillery and planes fighting wars to sell drugs that then come in, into the United States, okay? And so the Mexican authorities and, and the U.S. authorities are trying to fight these drug cartels. And here, if you, not, a, a, a few weeks ago, the most famous drug lord in, in Mexico who had been in prison managed somehow to escape. So a lot of these people who live in some of these towns where this violence is occurring, some of it has nothing to do with, with, with uh, power. Some of it has to do with they don't feel safe. And they're trying to get out of Mexico and to a place where they feel more safe. So they're coming to the United States. And it's created a huge political issue in the United States to the point that it's frankly brought out a lot of racism among people, people in the United States. But, you, but the impact of telling that story is, is that for me, not as a journalist, but for me as a person, there's, there, I, can, there's, I am going to be impacted. I am going to be influenced by that story. Because, so, so uh, I told you I grew up in the south of the United States, you know, down on the southern coastline. So on the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of those people are coming into that part of the country. A lot of them are coming there because they worked in agriculture and farming and things like that. So that part of the United States is, 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 is because the climate is warm and kind of subtropical. There's lots of farming in Texas and in Louisiana 
and Mississippi and Arkansas and all of those states that go across toward the East Coast. Lots of farming. Up into the Midwest, there's lots of farming. So a lot of these Mexican immigrants are coming there. So if I live in one of those towns, my life is somehow going to be impacted by that. So, so, um, so, so there's the impact of it. So, so this is what's happening in Europe. So every time you write a feature story, every time you start to write about something, if, if, you, if you are writing a story about a new popular entertainer, back to, to the question of, of entertainment being feature writing, if you are writing a story about a popular new entertainer, that story is about, you have to think about what is the impact of that story. Now, my life won't be significantly changed by it, but I care about the story because, you know, I think here's someone who, the, the, let's say it's a singer, there's, here's this music that I'm drawn to. So that's how my life is influenced by it. Okay, so sometimes it's not such significant ways as we might think. You know, I don't necessarily have to interact with those people, although, you know, what's changing about the United States is, um, and, and I'm, I'm struggling now to learn to speak Spanish because it's widely spoken in the United States. And so, um, so I, 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 as a young, as a high school student and a young man, I, I folk spoke passable, not very good, never good, but passable French that I've never gotten, and I've pretty much forgotten now. But so I'm struggling to learn to speak Spanish and, and because, because I need, to, frankly, I feel like I need to. Nobody's told me that I have to, but, but it impacts our lives. It influences our lives. It changes our lives. I want to be able to talk to people because that's one of the things I like to do. Okay, so that's the impact of the story. So, so it, it is that. It's, the other piece of impact is what is it in the story that makes your readers, your listeners, your viewers care? Why do I care? Sometimes my life isn't influenced by it. My life isn't, if, is, is not directly touched by it. But, but if, I, if, 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 if I am paying attention to stories, and, and, and I, I, by the way, I do follow a lot of stories of what, that happen in Africa because I just, because I care. I, 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 I care about things, about things that have to do with humanitarian issues about stories that have to do with climate. And this is my personal taste, not as a journalist, but because uh, I don't write, I've never, I've never, I've written about them from a, a political standpoint because I was primarily a political reporter. But as a Robert Naylor, the, the person, I care about, I care about humanitarian issues. I care about people getting food to eat and clean water to drink and safe homes to live in. I care about them having access to high quality health care. I care about farmers being able to raise good crops that are to the extent that's probably that are free of pesticides. I care about climate change and clean water. I care about what's happening to the natural species on our planet. I care about those things. Now, now to some degree, some of those things may actually impact my life, but much of it on a, on a daily basis is nothing that's actually going to touch me directly. But if, when I see those stories, I always read them. I always read them. Because, not because I, because of the, but because I care. So that's the other part of impact. It's, it's what influences us. It's what, it's what, you know, affects our lives. But the other part of impact is, um, is, is, is why do people care? And so that's one of the things that you ask. You need to ask for yourself when you start writing stories, is do people care? So not all stories can show an impact on the stories, but they can have some sort of clear paragraph that explains why you're writing the story. You've got to tell people, every time you write a story, you have to tell people why, you, why they should care about this story, every single time. So there, the other elements of it, of, of, of uh, a story structure, attribution, okay? So I, I read you the quotes in the story, but then there are other places where we'll write stories and we'll talk about, um, we'll talk, so, so I said I care about climate change, okay? So, so uh, um, if, 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 the, if the, the oceans are warming and I write a story about that and how it affects marine life, okay? How do I know this? And that's what you have to tell people. So one of, one of the problems with journalism you know, and it's, and, and it's one of the things I tell American students all the time. 
um, particularly in, in investigative reporting where we go out and we dig up things, you know, and it's, it's popular in America, in Western, popular in Western nations, period. So, so we tell people things and then we, we, we don't always want to attribute or we attribute it to anonymous sources. The problem with that is that people think we made it up. And, and, and back to this question that came up early in the week about truth and lies, that's one of the things that we, that, that, we, that we have to do is to tell people we are telling the truth. And I know that this is the truth because this person who is an expert says so. And one of the problems with, with journalism these days is we have, there was a, there was a piece in uh, one of the publications in America, uh, and, I, and I, I, I have it somewhere, I saved it, called The Death of Expertise where every opinion is as valid as every other opinion. Well, as journalists, we have to look for the valid opinions. And so if we quote somebody, if we, attrib if we write about something, we have to say, here's how I know this is true. And I know this is true because this person told me this is true, and here is this person's expertise in this area, okay? So if I write about um, I, I, the, 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 if, I, if I write a story that says climate change is affecting migration patterns of whales uh, off the Atlantic coast of, of the United States, then how do I know this? And how does the person who told me know this? And so that's where we get into the question of their, their expertise. So, um, and, and so we attribute those things to them. The next thing is context. And I've, I've, I've kind of thrown that word out there earlier, but I want to talk a little bit about it. Uh, where, what is the history or the background that the reader needs in order to understand how a problem or action occurred? So, so back to this story. Context. Here's, here's, here's what I've got. Is there any history or background the reader needs to, in order to understand how a problem or action occurred? So, so, um, so if we talk about... Um, one of the things you would talk about in this story, what people, and we don't get to it because I, only, I didn't paste, I didn't copy the whole story. This back to the story about the, the, the Syrian refugee. And what's happening is this civil war. So if we're going to talk about this guy, and we, there's a mention of the civil war, but we have, we have to explain to people why it is that this person felt the need to leave his country. Because most of us feel a great deal of attachment to our country, and in order to get up and leave, there has to be something. So, so that's the context. We need to tell people what happened. Why, is it, why did he leave? Why is he trying to go into this other country? The, the, other, people part is, uh, the other part of the context is comparing it to other events in history. And that's that sentence. Muhammad's voyage was part of a historic movement of humanity of more than 600,000 migrants this year that have crossed land and sea seeking sanctuary in Europe. Countries there have been struggling to cope with the biggest wave of migration since World War II. That's, the, that's context because it gives us a point of comparison. It gives us the perspective. And I said historic is a perspective word. So it gives us a point of reference. So if the story is about a, a fire, an accident, or a crime, then we talk about how many other th of those have been. So back to our story about the woman who was mugged on the street corner. How often has this happened in this neighborhood? That's what you want to ask yourself. You know, um, how often has this happened? And, and, and what's the community's reaction to it? Because communities react to things differently based on the frequency of them very often. And so here's the, here's the other thing that, that, is, that is critical to every story, is fairness and accuracy. And I kind of started off talking to you about this. And, 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 uh, and, and there's this whole concept of whether journalists are, are uh, objective. And, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a big word that, that's been thrown around for years. And one of the things I've talked about is fairness. So, so I believe that Every, every person has some kind of point of view. And we come from different backgrounds. We, we, we see things different. You, 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 you and I will look at two incidents and view them differently based on a lot of things, based on where we come from, 
based on how we grew up, based on the values that were instilled in us by our parents and the communities and the people that surrounded us, based on our educational levels and our educational backgrounds and where we went to school and the type of schools we went to, our religious beliefs, our personal beliefs, our personal lifestyles. So, 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 that's what this, so that's what this whole thing about fairness. And then back to that question about lies, accuracy. And one of the things I said to you is sometimes it, it's based on the, the, most, the, the smallest of things. So those are two things that are hallmarks of journalism. They are fundamental to journalism. For every story that you write, and you can never forget fairness and accuracy. If the story involves conflict, so, so remember we talked the other day about telling all sides of, the, of a story? If a story involves conflict, you should always get comment from both sides or all sides of an issue. So, so let's say, so let's say um, you think something involves two people. So, you know, um, so there's, so there's, um, let, let, let's say you see an incident and you're reporting on an incident that seemingly involves only two people. So it seems like there's both sides of an incident. But did other people witness it? Does it affect other people's lives? A lot of things like that. How does it impact other people? So, so that's the all sides of an issue. So make sure that we get both sides or all sides of an issue. Avoid one source stories. And this is the thing that journalists are very bad about doing. We find, even if it's a credible source. So, so, when, if, so we want to get people involved. We, if, if we write about something and someone tells us something, even, we, even if we know it's true, if we believe it's true, we need to get as many people to lend voices to that as, as we possibly can. Avoid one source stories. And make sure you attribute your stories, and that includes so much uh, information that you get from websites. When you, when you add information to your stories that's not yours, always attribute it. If it's websites, if it's other news organizations, and quotes and statements from people that you get. So if you're quoting somebody, you know, always, or if you, and, and, and and one of the things I want to say about quotes, and, and this is something we'll get a little into a little bit more as we talk, uh, as we actually start to write some, is uh, uh, reporters feel obligated sometimes to, to put quotes in a story. One of, your, one, of the, the, one of the decisions you have to make as a journalist when you are quoting someone is to whether directly quote them or whether to paraphrase what they say. So sometimes, sometimes really smart people are not always really articulate people. And, and so if they say something that is important to your story, but that was not very well stated, it is better for you to paraphrase them than, than to quote them directly, OK? But, 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 but basically what you want to do is make sure you attribute everything. But, but make sure that when you write, and when you approach any story, ask yourself that, am I being fair, and is my story being accurate? And, and wherever you go in the world, whether it's this country, or whether it's, it's Europe, or whether it's Asia, or whether it's, whether, it's, whether it's the Americas, people are always leery of journalists. They always are. And it's, it's not just here. They are always leery of journalists, and they think we lie. And so in order, we, for our own sake and our own credibility, because as I said earlier this week, you know, when you, when you credibility is always, it's, 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 it's what we have as journalists, it's our currency as journalists. Make sure you safeguard your credibility, your reputation. That's everything that you have. So somebody asked me about ending stories. So uh, how to end stories. One of the things you want to do is always make sure that your story has an ending to it. So most, most hard news stories sort of come to a logical conclusion when you're telling the story. But when you're doing feature writing, you, have to, you sometimes have to think of how you, what device are you going to use to end your story. So uh, um, you, you can point people to something in the future. Uh, what's, what should happen next? Uh, where can I go to find out more information? Um, is this been resolved? A lot of things like that. So, so, those, so you always want to end your story. Don't leave your, re we call it leaving the readers hanging. Don't just leave them out there not knowing what happened. Now, so if your story has a conclu conclusion to it, conclude in the story for them. If in, in, in a case like this where you perhaps are following someone who uh, um, 
who is doing something or who's escaped from something where the story hasn't ended, take a forward look at the story. Look into the future and, and explore the possibilities of what are likely to happen. So, um, so I just want to do a quick recap. We'll be done. Because this is what, so, so the elements of the story, the lead, the nut graph, and this is particularly important in features. And feature stories always need a nut graph. Supporting facts, including the impact, understanding the impact of your story, <clears throat> explaining to your readers, viewers, and listeners the impact of your story, getting them to understand it, quotes and comments, attributing things in your story to make sure that it's fair, that it's accurate, giving them people as many additional facts as you can, pointing them to other sources when you can, crediting those sources when you use them yourself, and then the ending. Make sure your story has an ending. Either finalize it for them now, tell them what the outcomes are. If there is no outcome, then give them some point of reference about what is, may or may not happen in the future.